When the Taliban took over Afghanistan, people started telling Obaidullah Bahir that he'd better get out. He's a lecturer in transitional justice at the American University of Afghanistan, and he's often been critical of the Taliban. But Obaidullah didn't listen. He wanted to help the country build its future. He just didn't necessarily think that helping would sound like this call. We had foreigners stuck here that I helped move into the airport. They had 40 dogs left behind. And the local commander who had guaranteed that he would keep the dogs safe ended up demanding for extra money, a lot of extra money to keep the dogs alive until the evacuation plane came in. And because of my unique position of someone who can call up the leadership of the Taliban and complain. I picked up the phone, and even though at the back of my mind, I was like, okay, this is the third day of the call of Kabul, and your first call to this Taliban leader is going to be about saving dogs. But I placed that call, and eventually those dogs were rescued, and they were moved into the airport. And these are things that would not have happened um, if I were not there. And every day has a few of those examples and things that I can do here. See, Obaidullah has an interesting position in the new Afghanistan, one he's still figuring out. On the one hand, he's got a graduate degree from Australia and gives talks at Western universities like Oxford on intractable conflicts. But he's also the grandson of an infamous political figure once known as the Butcher of Kabul. Note, I have lost friends to the Taliban. Uh, I have lost commandos. I have lost common friends and family members to this fighting. And his father went on live TV to congratulate the Taliban when they took over the city. Well, some of his friends were still fleeing in fear. These were from good families. They had built their houses and dreams for decades. I had a friend who had a wardrobe as big as the whole wall. And if there was one thing they were really crazy about was dressing up. And they had to leave in one t-shirt. So um, yeah, it was difficult knowing that uh, half of your family was happy for the change that had happened. I'm Lacey Healy. And today, on a special bonus episode of Things That Go Boom, how did Obaidullah find himself sitting between two very different worlds? And as he tries to reconcile those worlds within himself, what does Afghanistan need to do the same? Hey, it's Lacey. As you likely already know, we are living in the golden age of cybercrime. How can we ensure the security of our information and our financials, not to mention our peace of mind? Well, I recommend listening to What the Hack with Adam Levin. It's a weekly true crime podcast featuring tales of hacks, scams, and a rattle bag of cyber swindles. Learn about the dangers of trolling opponents, discover what sort of links you should never, ever click, and get the inside scoop on all sorts of crazy scams happening on your favorite apps. So go ahead, follow What the Hack with Adam Levin on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Obaidullah really loves his country, even if, for most of his life, he wasn't there. I grew up in exile. My family was in political exile, and I hadn't been to Afghanistan more than once or twice when I was like five or six years old. So when I was a full-grown man and I crossed the border of Afghanistan for the first time, I remember kissing uh, the soil and my brother being the overly pragmatic, cold-hearted person that he is uh, hated on me for it. And he said that you're just overly emotional and dramatic. And, and I was like, this is my home, you know? To really understand that moment, though, you need to go back even further, to the 70s, when Obaidullah's grandfather, Gobaldin Hikmachar, was just getting started. I see the Taliban marching in, and I realize that this seed for this eventual outcome in takeover of Kabul was laid by my grandfather. And this was a dream that he never managed to achieve, but a movement after him, a few generations after him, managed to do so. 
Afghanistan's monarchy was sputtering out, and the country's youth were at a crossroads between fighting for a communist or Islamic government. Hikmatar was in the thick of it. Some have said that this rumor was just Soviet propaganda, but journalist Steve Call says that Hikmatar was accused of throwing acid on women who didn't cover themselves at school. In 1972, he was implicated in the killing of a communist student militant, and he went to prison for two years. This was a man who, in his 20s, started the biggest movement in Afghanistan. It was called the Muslim Youth Movement, and they would start demonstrations, they would start small cells of groups that would get together and study Islam and basically preach for political Islam. And this was at a time when the communist influence was really out of control in Afghanistan. Honestly, they would not have gotten along to begin with, but during their university years, eventually clashes started happening and the movement turned more violent because the government was cracking down and killing them and arresting them. Eventually, the communists took control and the Soviets joined in. The Soviets invaded Afghanistan, and that's when the real fighting then started. That's where the U.S. comes in. Hikmatar and other religious fighters would wind up holding CIA-funded weapons while they fought to get the Soviets out of their home. The support that the United States has been providing the resistance will be strengthened rather than diminished so that it can continue to fight effectively for freedom. A just struggle against foreign tyranny can count upon worldwide support, both political and material. When the Soviets left, his group and others fought a brutal civil war, where he was accused of multiple human rights violations and attacks on civilians. Then he briefly became prime minister. But eventually, he was exiled by the Taliban when it took control. After the Twin Tower attacks, when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, Hikmatyar's group reconvened to fight back. Which brings us to Obaidullah's childhood, living outside of Afghanistan, but entrenched in the struggle for what it might become. I think when we were much younger, it was just a constant attempt of trying to live up to the legends of father and the forefathers and my grandfather. One night, a year after the U.S. invasion, Obaidullah's dad, Kirat Bahir, this was Hekmatar's son-in-law, was whisked away from their home in Pakistan and tortured by the CIA. Obaidullah was 11 years old. They came from this way, actually. This road from here up to there, it was blocked. And there were about, two, about 200 people, police and uh, intelligence guys and uh, Americans. Americans yeah, as yeah, well? Yes, 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 yes. It was 2 o'clock midnight. Bahir was handcuffed, hooded, and taken away, along with his friend and former driver, Gul Rahman, who years earlier was a bodyguard for the group's leader. That was the last time Bahir saw Gul alive. As Obaidullah watched the U.S. attack the people he loved, he was learning to hate the West and everything it stood for. I spent my initial five, six years in Saudi Arabia. I then moved to Pakistan, where I continued uh, studying in Arabic. So up till high school, I studied Arabic. We had a Salafist Saudi school, which was pretty hardline and radical. So we grew up extremely radicalized. Obaidullah even thought about joining his grandfather's rebel group. Growing up, obviously, with the background that I had, it was very likely that I would take for granted the truths that were handed down to me as to who was the enemy and who was the friend. But eventually when I had reached my peak and I wanted to actually go into Afghanistan and take part in the fighting, and my dad stopped me and part of his argument was that he would be taken away again if I went. And on the other end, he told me that this fight wasn't as straightforward as I thought it was. So your father actually told you not to get involved with the Taliban or with anti-American fighting? Uh, well, his counter-argument was m much more nuanced and sophisticated than that. He actually sat down and he broke down the different factions that I could go to. I hadn't told him that I was going to my grandfather's faction. And he said, if you go to your grandfather, I'll get him to send you back. <laughs> 
if you go to the Taliban, we really don't know whether they have it in them to tolerate the grandson of Hikmatyar. So they might actually off you. And if you go to the Arabs, for them, this has become more than just a religious war. It has become a personal vendetta and you will get consumed by it. For Abidala, hearing this from his dad, with everything he'd experienced at the hands of the U.S., it carried weight. This was someone who had been forced into a coffin with the lid on it as an interrogation technique, made to feel like he was dying. Someone who for years only heard silence when the soldiers changed the music blaring on the loudspeakers in his cell. The torture program that had a whole Senate committee sit over and eventually get declassified. My father was one of the first people who was put through that program with Khalid al-Sheikh and all the other people. If that person, with all the rage and anger and hatred he had towards the West, could stop me, then then there was a lot more to think about than I actually initially thought. And that thought eventually grew on me. As Abidala pursued his own education, he realized that he and his family didn't have to think about this conflict the same way. Eventually, it started seeping in that there was stuff that I wanted to do different. And you can't really pinpoint it, actually. My conversations now, even with my grandfather, are quite fascinating because he sees my work, he sees what I write, he sees the lectures I give, and he knows that those aren't in line with what he believes in. But I had this conversation with him where I said, listen, I do not hold an official position in your party. I do not have to be your spokesperson. I am my own voice, I have my own opinion, and I will not shy away from saying it out loud. So I hope you have it in you to tolerate that. I guess there's always a point where two people realize that they're bound to each other by familial ties and there's no getting rid of each other. But that doesn't mean that you give each other that room to be your own people. It's just here, it's not a very small matter of a dress code or a career path. It's very core beliefs. And we're managing to get by so far, so I'm hoping that we can keep doing so. Those core beliefs do look different. On social media, Obaidala reads contemporary poetry by young female writers, and he breaks down things like the reasons why corporal punishment is a bad way for the Taliban to hand out justice. Our whole idea is constructive criticism, and if we don't point it out, no one will, and they will keep repeating the same mistakes. He's also had some very unique talks with his dad about where the country should go next. Unlike my cousins who would outrightly go up to my father and say, oh, listen, you guys are wrong. and I don't do that with him. I realize that he's served a cause for 50, 60 years of his life. And it's unfair of me to expect him to be willing to negate and cancel out all of that or disown all of that. But I also take a stand for who I am. So... There is that constant conversation and this back and forth of trying to win each other over. And I would tell him about all the horrible things that the Taliban are currently doing. And then he would tell me about all the positive that we gained. And I think a few years earlier, it was it was quite difficult to be these two people that I was. But eventually I managed to reconcile. It's not just him who managed to reconcile. Obaidullah's grandfather signed a peace deal with the previous Afghan government in 2017. And his dad was a delegate for peace negotiations between the Taliban and the former regime, before the Taliban ended up winning the war. Sometimes his family says he's too outspoken. I would sit with the Taliban and I'd tell them that I work with the American University. This was a conversation I had with one of their highest ranking leaders on a few days after the regime fell, whereas other people wouldn't think that very smart to do. And sometimes his friends think he's whitewashing the Taliban. I try to not dehumanize the Taliban because if the reality is that we have to live with them, right? Like, I keep saying this, I don't want the Taliban to fail because them failing means Afghanistan fails. It means that a failed state will have years that it suffers under the rule of the Taliban until by some other 
force brutal revolution the Taliban can be removed. Honestly, we're just exhausted. So what can we learn from Obaidullah's efforts to bridge these two worlds, to keep coming to the table with the people he loves without bending his own principles? And if he doesn't want the Taliban to fail, then what does Afghanistan need to succeed? I wish that the same way I could reconcile these two very different people to two very different worlds within me, that Afghanistan can manage to do so as well. But that would need time, that would need tolerance, and that would need some level of forward thinking, long-term thinking. And I don't know if the Taliban have that in them. More coming up after the break. There's a long history of occupying forces in Afghanistan trying to promote this image of the people fighting back as subhuman. If you look at Alexander's uh, chronicles, Alexander the Great's campaigns in Afghanistan, he talks about facing these savage warriors. And then the British Empire had this narrative of savages fighting barbarians, which means they would hire some local Afghans to fight the other Afghans that were opposing the British and say that one of them are barbarians, the others are savages, so really all no rules apply here. And the U.S. has done the same, even as we cozied up to some pretty power-hungry characters ourselves. And the Americans used this whole warlord narrative as well, so the ones that were in their favor working for them, they were tribal or popular leaders within Afghanistan, and those who were not in their favor ended up becoming warlords. Obaidullah says, as long as we see enemy combatants as inhuman, we're off the hook for things like rules of engagement or fair play in war. After all, they're not an opposing army. They're a crazy insurgent group. And if they don't follow the rules, well, why should we? He says Afghanistan's success will hinge on finding a way, like his family, to bridge the divide. When you start seeing people beyond the context that they grew up in and beyond the ideology that was fed to them, you understand that at the core of it is just another human being that you can talk to. And that's what I keep telling myself about the Taliban as well. A generation for 20 years kept fighting. We've only seen the worst of them. And now for the first time they are here and we have to interact with them. And whether we like it or not, if we want a more sustainable and functional Afghanistan, we would need to bring out the good in them. And we'd want to show them the good within us. After all, remember all that history you heard before the break? That's the country the Taliban took hold of in the 90s. The Afghanistan they ruled 25 years ago was a senile man who had exerted all his energy and then was willing to be dragged around anywhere and everywhere because it had just come out of a bloody civil war and the only thing that mattered was the war ending and some sort of physical security returning. Right now, this is a generation of Afghans who are educated, who have dreams, who have seen a life, who demand that living standard as well. And... um, the Taliban would have to deal with them, just like we have to accept them as a reality, they have to accept us. That's what was giving him hope when we called him. But that hope has been fleeting. First, the stakes in Afghanistan are so high right now. The country is on the brink of an economic crisis. You have to go to a bank and wait for like a few hours to get your turn, and you are only allowed to extract $200 per week. That means Afghanistan is going to need technocrats and intellectuals, sort of like him, who can help plan things. There's so much to do here, and I'm hoping the Taliban have it in them to realize that there are people here who genuinely love this country, who didn't work for the previous regime. We worked and served our country, and we want to serve our people. I was sitting with the governor of Ghor province, the Talib governor of Ghor province. And I was just telling him how the emergency hospital for COVID built in his province was my project. I'd taken that money from the Asian Development Bank. 
And I could see happiness in his eyes, right? So I'm sure there are people amongst them that realize the utility of infrastructure, of development, of the country moving forward, economic prosperity. And uh, yeah, very thin rope of hope we hang on to. Let's hope that it doesn't break. So what would moving forward under the Taliban look like? Initially, the formation of an inclusive government is really important. The integration of the Taliban fighters is really important. That means that the Taliban fighters would have to be trained and integrated either into the military apparatus or generally given vocational training and skills to go on and be able to sustain themselves economically. The current approach from the Taliban of handing out ministries and government positions as spoils of wars to their commanders isn't really the smartest political move on their part. There were also huge problems with corruption in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Obaidullah says that this moment is a chance to look under the hood and make sure any members of the last government that joined this one are honest brokers. But if it's the Taliban making those calls, it could look like they're just undercutting the opposition. So they really have to create a third impartial body that looks into the previous histories of embezzlement and corruption from the other political elites before they can be merged into the new political order. There's one more thing that Obaidullah says will be really important if the Taliban is going to succeed as a government. Building some institutionalism. Right now, when its leaders make a promise on something like human rights or amnesty for former government workers, there's no guarantee that will be the reality. He says there's a reason for that. The Taliban were a loosely affiliated, fluid insurgency that was fighting for one common cause, which worked in their advantage. That meant that they could have a lot of agency, all those splinter cells could do what they wanted. But now when they are in a position of governance, they really need people who can take an order and implement it. And that hasn't been happening, which is why we see this whole inconsistency in the way that the public or general amnesty that was promised to uh, people associated with the government before this wasn't really implemented that well in the provinces. The victim has been named as Banu Nigar, a policewoman from the city of Farocco, which is the capital of central Gore province. The Taliban is being blamed for the killing. A spokesperson for the group has promised to investigate. But this the is story of the female police officer Nigar, who was pulled off of her house in Ghor while six months pregnant for working for the police and the previous regime. Which brings me to something that we've been thinking a lot about here at Things That Go Boom since the withdrawal. Women's rights. This is just the latest report of violence and repression against women. Two weeks ago, after women started protesting in Kabul for their rights. Dozens of Afghan women protested near the presidential palace in Kabul to demand equal rights. They want the Taliban to recognize women's rights to work, to f have freedom of movement, to education and political participation. Some commanders tried to talk to them. Others lashed out. Taliban gunmen fire into the air to crush the protests on the streets of Kabul. Moments that brought up memories of the Taliban's harsh treatment in the 90s. The Taliban has also announced plans to segregate men and women in different classes, which would make women's education a lot less accessible. And while photos of women in all black supporting the Taliban have made the rounds on social media. The demonstrators also criticized the women who protested against Taliban in recent days, proclaiming that women not wearing hijab and niqab are harming all women in Afghanistan. Other Afghan women have been responding with their own photos of themselves in vibrant traditional dress. They accuse the Taliban of not being traditional at all, but going against Afghanistan's very traditions and cultures. So how does the international community fit in? Well, Obaidullah says that we have to walk a tricky balance between pulling the Taliban toward international norms and standards without alienating the group entirely or cutting off help to the country's poorest citizens. If they're saying that they will abide by certain conditions that have been set forth, that's a good start. That's a change for the Taliban that were 25 years ago. 
So there's a very thin sort of thread that's uh, connecting the West or the United States and its allies and the Taliban. And we're hoping that doesn't get cut off so that roping in looks like deterring them with sanctions, looks like incentivizing them with international recognition and foreign aid and then maintaining that balance, not expecting too much based on those conditions. I want to ask you about the U.S. You just spoke a little bit about the U.S. role that can't be denied here. How do you feel about the U.S. withdrawal? Is there a sense there that the U.S. has abandoned people? Of course. The United States abandoned Afghanistan. He supports the withdrawal, but he disagrees with how it was carried out and with how it was talked about in the West. We wanted the withdrawal to happen. The Kabul Afghan knew that the major instigator and cause of war was the existence of foreign troops. So we wanted them to leave. The idea was, was it done responsibly? No. Was it done smartly? No. Was it done through any sense of responsibility towards the common Afghan people? No. Look, yes, the idea that the Taliban blitz took only 11 days to capture all of Afghanistan That is probably the swiftest military takeover in modern history. It was partially due to the corruption of the previous regime. It was partially because of their extreme unpopularity amongst the rural population. But also one of the major reasons the Afghan Defense Forces could not resist much was because they spent 20 years being trained with American tactical air support being available to them. And as per their agreement with the Taliban, the United States not only stopped offering that aerial support, but they also signed the deal that said that they would not even allow American contractors to be available to support the Afghan army. So basically, it's just like they tied both the arms of the Afghan defense forces and expected them to fight. Obaidala notes that when the U.S. negotiated a deal with the Taliban, we gave the group a measure of legitimacy it could leverage internationally, like sitting at Doha peace talks with the former Afghan government covered by media around the world. That was not a winning strategy for America. The whole narrative that the Taliban had of an impending victory was created and given to them by the United States. They said, if we could defeat the world hegemon, What chance did their puppet regime have against us? Which was why the morale of the fighters was in the sky. And they knew that victory was coming one way or the other. Which is why on the other end, the Afghan forces really didn't have much conviction or motivation left. But that being said, the United States, I think, played a commendable role in extracting a lot of Afghans to safety. I think taking out more than 100,000 people is something that world history hadn't witnessed, that Afghans would remember forever. I think that is a kindness on the American part. Again, no thanks to Biden, but like generally the American populists as well. But credit where credit is due. Again, he is the administration and maybe for him, it sort of helped him get over some of the guilt. But there's things that one can't forget. In a few weeks, Obaidullah will be marking the 20th anniversary of a day that changed everything. Good afternoon. October 7th. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. This wasn't a war that the Afghans chose. There weren't Afghans on the planes in 9-11, yet hundreds of thousands of Afghan women, children, men had to pay for, for a war with their lives, a war that they didn't start, a war that they didn't want, and an end to that war that they didn't really anticipate or vote for, for our common humanity's sake. The international community owes a lot to the Afghans. So the best that you can do is look into your localities, see if Afghan people have moved there, help them, be kind to them, and those will be 
memories that they will hold. Honestly, uh, there is a culture of humanity that unites us. Those interactions, those initial interactions that are going to shape the way they see America, the way that they hope for their future lives. And it's up to you. It's up to you, the common person that goes and helps these Afans out, that's going to help them have some hope for a future. Things That Go Boom is produced by Inkstick Media and distributed by PRX. This episode was produced by Katie Toth and me, and it was edited by Ruth Morris and Layla Ujali. Darian Shulman writes the music for our show, and Robin Wise makes each episode sound its best. As always, we want to thank the foundations that make our work possible, the Carnegie Corporation of New York and Plowshares Fund, as well as Inkstick supporters, including the Cologne Foundation, Craig Newmark Foundation, Prospect Hill Foundation, and the Jubitz Family Foundation. And thank you to all of you for supporting our show. Don't forget, if you like the show, to leave us a review. You'd be surprised what a difference those make. And of course, you can always come visit us anytime over on social at Inkstick Media. We'll see you right back here for a new season in the new year. But stick around because we have more bonus content coming your way in the meantime. I was misquoted after an interview with Sky News where I said, Biden's words sound like someone who punches you in the gut and then tells you about all the amazing things that they did for you after the punch. And uh, I think there was a website that quoted me as saying, I will punch the American president in the gut. And I'm like, there goes my American visa ever in life. (laughs) From Pew. 